Now I'm going to last. Hello, everybody. I'm John Wiley. Until last week, the head of Sky News for 17 years. We're up here to talk about the difficult decisions news organizations have to make trying to balance the need to pursue hard investigative news at the same time, difficult thing, break even, make money. Up here with me are some of the world's leading global leaders, fantastic leaders and decision takers. Formidable, formidable experts in their different spheres. Steve Hasker, CEO of the massive Thomson Reuters. You're responsible for 25,000 staff in 75 countries, big job. Deborah Turness, the big boss of BBC News and Current Affairs, calmly navigating her way through BBC journalism, times through turbulent waters. Sir Mike Moritz, a brilliant tech entrepreneur, an uber successful digital, digital investor, and a slight contrarian. And Catherine Viner, not only the first female editor of The Guardian, but you've also driven The Guardian for the first time in a very long time to making profit. Thank you all for taking part. Round one. <laughs> Steve, news is just a small part of Thomson Reuters' overall business, but still news is a big deal for you. You're the world's largest multimedia news provider. What are you spending on news and how does Reuters make money out of it? Well, thanks, John. Uh, let, let me start uh, with a quote from um, Sir Harry. I, I think he said that uh, you need a benevolent owner, but not one that burns banknotes in the street. Um, and I, I think I speak for you, David, when I say that that's the approach that the Thomson Reuters board takes toward Reuters, which is um, we're extraordinarily proud of the work uh, that Alessandra and her teams uh, take. We're extraordinarily uh, proud of the relationships uh, that we have with in serving Deborah and serving Catherine at BBC and, and Guardian. Um, but it is a commercial enterprise. Uh, and so we're always looking to, uh, uh, to get a commercial return and create more opportunities for great journalists. And that's the sort of the orientation. But in answer to your question, uh, John, uh, so think about Reuters as about 10% uh, financially of Thomson Reuters. Um, the rest of Thomson Reuters is a leading provider of uh, content and software to lawyers, tax and accounting professionals, and risk and compliance professionals. Um, now, within Reuters, um, the, the sort of business model of Reuters uh, comprises a couple of different things. Um, the first is, uh, is the relationship with our, um, with our agency customers, uh, BBC and Guardian, uh, and many, many other global news organizations. Uh, and the second is a relationship with, uh, with the London Stock Exchange Group, where we're the news provider uh, for sort of financial market moving news uh, on a minute to minute basis. Um, and in addition to that, we obviously uh, from time to time uh, provide uh, news to uh, direct to consumers, which, which we believe is very, very good for our journalists to get their, their names and their stories and their photographs uh, and, and, and all of their work out there. So, you know, it, it is a balance uh, between, um, between investing in investigative journalism uh, and uh, in serving our customers. And uh, I think they're joined by two executives on the stage who, for example, the work, the groundbreaking work that we did in Nigeria that, um, uh, that Alessandra talked about earlier this morning, um, both the BBC and The Guardian were, uh, I think, extremely uh, good about getting that story out there uh, in a way that some of the agency customers are a bit more loath to do. So it is a balance, but it's, uh, it's one that we're uh, very proud to undertake. Thank you. Deborah, last September, you became the CEO of BBC News at a time of cutbacks, a freeze on the license fee, and you need to find an extra 285 million pounds a year by 2027. That's quite a tough gig, even for someone like you. How hard is it for the BBC now to support the enormous cost of investigative journalism? So um, that 280 has actually gone up to 400 million now with inflation. So, so superinflation has, has increased that. Um, but, you know, it, that piece is about um, focusing on delivering value for all. That's the strategy at the BBC. It's value for all. It's working out 
who your audience are, where they are, who you're reaching, who you're having trouble reaching and making sure that whether that's a shift to digital or focusing on specific audiences who we're currently finding it harder to reach, making sure that the investment goes to the right place and create, you know, making choices and priorities. I've come, as you know, from the commercial world all my life, like, like you, most of it, um, and uh, coming to BBC where there's a, a mixed funding model. So there are three key sources of income for BBC News. There's licence fee, uh, then there's some government uh, funding that goes directly to World Service. And then we have outside the UK, uh, some commercial activities that comes back in to supplement the licence fee and help us invest in journalism. But in the UK, um, we are working within a model of universality. Everybody pays for BBC. The BBC must be for everyone. And that's not a commercial relationship. It's a trust relationship. And so I see our currency as trust. And in a world of fake news and disinformation, where consumers tell us they find it harder and harder to trust, even brands like BBC, when we tell them you know, what we know, um, we've got to shift that. And where we've got to invest is to invest in bringing investigative journalism into everyday news. You know, here on this stage, you've talked a lot this morning about the tools and techniques that are used now to deliver open source journalism, verification. We have all of that, but the audience doesn't actually know it because they don't see it. And where we are now investing uh, is to bring those tools out into the open, uh, to deliver a form of open journalism, radical transparency, and in the coming weeks, you'll still start to launch very deliberately something we're calling BBC Verify, which is a new brand within our brand. Uh, I've, we've brought together uh, the teams who do um, video verification, geolocation, chronolocation, data journalism, those open source techniques, this kind of Bellingcat were the leaders in the field many years ago. Um, and we're going to pull back the curtain. And even in our core content on our core traditional broadcast platforms, as well as digital live pages, we're going to be talking about and showing more and more of that journalism to build that trust. And that's where we're investing. Of course, we're invested in long form as well and podcasts and those places where you might more naturally find greater levels of transparency and in-depth journalism. But I believe that we must bring it to the centre because it's those techniques that will help us be more transparent with the audiences and build the trust. Very clear, thank you. Mike, you've been on both sides of the journalism business. A former journalist for Time magazine, became a tech billionaire as an early investor in Google, PayPal and Yahoo. And 15 months ago, you launched the San Francisco Standard and you've had phenomenal growth with that. What do you think is the best model for journalism? Well, I'm on... Um with my co-founder who's here, Griff Gaffney, who's the CEO of the San Francisco Standard, we're on a voyage to discover that. And um, I would not claim that we have demonstrated the answers yet. What we've demonstrated so far is a stunning ability to operate a not-for-profit. Um, but <laughs> uh, uh, the, but um, it, it, the San Francisco Standard is set up as a commercial enterprise. I. I think while there's a noble, wonderful place for not-for-profit journalism, I, I'm a big believer in the fact that the best journalism will come out of self-sustaining businesses. And uh, that's what we are. And both Griff and I now look at the journalism world through the eyes of, uh, through the four eyes of outsiders, not insiders. And um, what we're trying to do is reimagine what you can do as a trusted voice in a major local community. And we're 15 months in. Uh, nobody gave us a chance at the beginning. 12 months ago, we had 30,000 users in the prior 30 days. Last month, we had 3 million users in the prior 30 days. And that has been done without um, any paid marketing, any uh, purchase of uh, customers. And it's all centered around what we think we can do for the one word that hasn't been mentioned or the two words that haven't been mentioned today so far, which is the customer. And that's how we're shaping and and thinking about the standard. At the moment, everybody can access the standard um, uh, without any fee. Uh, although, interestingly, we've had a whole bunch of people send us checks unsolicited 
um, saying that they want to uh, want to support us, and ditto actually with with sponsors. So I'm very happy with where we are today. But if I uh, step back a little bit and say where we aspire to be in San Francisco and in that community, I'd give ourselves a two out of ten for where we are today. I've read that you don't believe in what you call tin cup journalism. You want to explain that, please? <laughs> well, as I said, I think. Um, it, it has a role. I just don't see that um, the not-for-profit model lends itself to being able to generate the profits that you can then plow back into the quality of the product. And I come from a world in the last 25 years where, uh, you know, every little company starts with nothing. And then what you're trying to do is generate cash so that you can continually obviously make profits, but you can continually reinvest in strengthening your products, doing more for the customer uh, that you have gotten in the very early years and gradually expanding the sorts of things that you can do to please and thrill. And in this case, inform and entertain and educate uh, the customer. And so for us, it's all about using um, self-sustaining for-profit model as a way to strengthen our product. Okay, thank you. Catherine, The Guardian is supported by a foundation, the Scott Trust, and you were in a financial hole when you took over. You've climbed out of it without a paywall by asking for voluntary donations. Is there editorial freedom in not chasing profit? Is that what you meant by the tin cup yeah. model? Um, I mean, we are profit-seeking, actually. That's the terminology we use about The Guardian. So we're not not-for-profit. We are profit-seeking. We obviously have a mixed model um, with um, advertising as well. But I do think uh, what's significant for this conference is... Uh, this voluntary contributions model that we introduced in 2016 to much hilarity. Everyone's sort of saying, why would you pay for something you could get for free? Um, the begging bowl jokes and so on. Um, but actually, I think the readers really understood it. And what was very clear right from the beginning was that uh, what readers really wanted to give us money for was the more, most serious, most difficult investigative reporting. Um, and so um, and it's, it's an incredibly inspiring thing that the readers have led us, shown us the way. Uh, we've not, with our investigations team is about four times the size of when I started. We're just about to advertise for a new investigations team in the US. Um, and they're just having hit after hit. They're inspiring the rest of the newsroom, similar to the way Deborah's talking about, that everyone can, everyone can be an investigative journalist if they, they get the right tip off or, and they've got the right techniques. And so I think it's a really important part of our model going forward that the, the readers, you know, we're, we're, on, we're in the public interest um, and, and the readers are very supportive in that. The harder the, the investigation, the more challenging, um, you know, the more legal attacks we have, the more the readers come, to, come and back us. Um, and so I think it's a really inspiring model for investigative journalism. Thank you. Deborah, as you spoke earlier, you're trying to tackle misinformation with a high-profile transparency initiative. And then, whatever it was, two weeks ago, the chairman of the BBC, Richard Sharp, resigns for a lack of transparency. How does the BBC and you reconcile that affair and are able still to maintain trust with your audiences? So for me, um, it's about how we cover the story of ourselves. Um, you know, a story about impartiality must be covered with maximum impartiality. And the way that the BBC's news teams covered ourselves without fear or favour, doubling the length of the media show and doing a special edition, um, you know, interviewing the chairman about, about the issues, I think that's where you protect the trust that's invested in you because you actually deliver on the story about yourself. And I've been on the outside for many years and watched the BBC deal with issues and scandals about itself and around itself and have always wondered how that happens because I think in commercial world, it's dealt with very differently. But the BBC deals with it with transparency in its news organisation, discusses all of the angles and genuinely approaches it without fear or favour. And I think that, even in those challenging circumstances, is how you protect the trust. Okay. Catherine, is it a case of innovate to survive? Some of the biggest cash cows for the New York Times, for instance, are you know, its web-based game Wordle and its cooking app. 
Does the Guardian think about other streams of revenue going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I do think the heart of the Guardian always needs to be, you know, news investigations, finding things out. But historically, I mean, I think we've had a very intense news period, obviously since 2016. But but you know, historically, the Guardian has been very famous for its sort of non-news journalism features journalism and consumer journalism done in a very Guardian way. And so I think innovating around some of those areas could be, it could be a really interesting thing. Um, I don't know, the wordle craze is slightly over though, isn't it, John? So maybe it's a bit of a short-lived thing. Are you going to give us any clues what you might be doing next? A few irons in a few fires. Probably. Okay. Steve, you um, last week announced a profit and a new $100 million investment into artificial intelligence, AI. What sort of form will that investment take? Uh, and are you going to try and tackle disinformation at the same time? So um, uh, I, I don't know in all honesty whether 100 million US dollars a year in AI is nearly enough. Or, uh, you, but we, what we wanted to do was, was send uh, our customers uh, and, and equally importantly our colleagues a message that we view uh, AI as a transformational moment. You know, Michael and I were comparing note, notes beforehand and talked about the, the PC on every desk and then the internet, mobile, social, cloud. AI feels bigger than those. Uh, I think Michael's got more expertise than I do, but AI feels bigger and more important. So we really wanted to put a stake in the ground uh, and say we're going to invest behind this and we're going to do what it takes to make sure that, that each and every one of our journalists, each and every one of our data scientists and engineers has uh, access to it. Um, exactly where, we, where we'll spend it, um, I, I'd say watch this space. Uh, we'll make some announcements over the next weeks and months. Um, but we're excited about uh, the opportunities that AI will, will, will enable in terms of transforming professions. Um, and we're also, I, I think, we have a healthy sort of sobriety about uh, its power to disrupt, not only uh, our business, but all businesses and all professions. Um, and so, uh, you know, and I think, I hope modest enough to know we don't really know where it's going to go, but we're standing sort of poised, ready to invest and, uh, and pivot as we need to. Deborah, AI for the BBC? Yes. When I think of AI, um, and we, like you, are very invested in understanding how, how best to use it and how, you know, how it can work for us, but also understanding how it can be our, it is our number one non-mortal enemy in, in the future. I think of three things. I think number one, AI is already weaponizing disinformation. Um, so how do we understand that? But how can we also weaponize it, for example, in BBC Verify to help us tackle disinformation because we can use it on both sides? Uh, and how can it be, you know, our weapon to fight AI itself? And then in our newsrooms, in our operations areas, how can it be deployed to release human effort into doing more of the high-end work which is going to build trust? But how do we do that as an industry whilst protecting the security and safety of the information? How do we make sure that we're protecting the consumer and everything that they receive from us? And so I think we're not, we're not there yet. I mean, it's sort of exponentially growing as a story, as an issue, as a topic, and as an opportunity as we speak. Uh, and I think we've got to look at all three of those areas in tandem. And, we, and indeed we are at the BBC. Mike, AI, threat, opportunity, both? Well, we're, we're very lucky at the stand because we live in the absolute epicenter of this flowering of, the, um, of, um, uh, of AI. And um, Barry Diller earlier was mentioning Elon and, and Sam Altman. I mean, Elon's Twitter office is less than half a mile from where we are at the standard. Um, Open AI started in an office that we... Um, uh, that Sequoia um, furnished to Sam uh, when he started it as a, as a not-for-profit, and they're right around the corner from us. So we're right in the middle of it. And I think we see it as, uh, and uh, our thrust is largely harnessing this incredible breakthrough in software to run our business a lot more efficiently. And so in every aspect of the business, I mean, we're still very small, but as the business grows, we'll be using it in content marketing, we'll be using it in legal, we'll be using it in finance, we'll be using it in customer service and customer support. It's going to be, allow us to accelerate much more quickly than uh, the startup of even five years ago. Uh, and it's going to, and, and this obviously has nothing to do with, I think, what the prime concern of this 
audience would be, which is the, you know, the, the challenge of AI for disinformation and all the other stuff. I'm just focusing on how we run our business a lot better with it. And then we, then we have all sorts of ideas about how we can ap apply it intelligently in what we present to our customer. Okay, thank you very much. Catherine, we know advertisers can be wary, wary of their adverts being placed next to hard news. We had that at Sky. What kind of pressure do you get from advertisers at The Guardian when you run controversial investigations, and how do you deal with that? I mean, there's, there's no pressure that, that reaches me. We don't, I mean, I think all those kinds of advertisers probably don't advertise with The Guardian, to be honest. And I think, <laughs> you know, the kind of advertisers that come to The Guardian really like being around, you know, the kind of journalism that speaks truth to power and holds the powerful to account. You know, they, they know what they're getting with The Guardian um, and, um, you know, it's part, of the, it's part of the package of what we offer. So, um, I mean, we, you know, and, and anyway, the journalism would always come first. I mean, that's, that's obviously so in our... you take a you know, robust line on that? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Honestly? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Have you, do you know something I don't? No, no, no. I just want to be really clear about that because uh, I know from personal experience there can be quite uh, difficult yeah. things sometimes. Um, I mean, so it's, we, we do have this fantastic ownership model that guarantees, um, you know, that the journalism is always, always protected and the editor is a step as head of the chief exec and so can turn down any advert. So, it, you know, that is a great model for journalism. So we're very lucky. You are. You're very yeah. lucky. Um, Mike, are we... Something you want to tell us, John? No. <laughs> yeah, I feel there's a story here somewhere. I think there is. Um, you may have heard earlier, uh, just before lunch, uh, Barry Diller talked very passionately about the, how the media was supine, supine, while digital platforms stole the content that news organizations paid to report and create, while at the same time opening the floodgates to fake news. Do you think there's a case that those platforms now owe serious journal journal journalism meaningful financial support? Well, I'm far less charitable about the decline of um, the traditional media businesses. And I think, uh, uh, and, and while I have a lot of sympathy and empathy for it, I mean, my business, my, uh, the investment business at Sequoia is about disrupting uh, entrenched businesses. And so it was very easy pickings to go, um, you know, we were original uh, investors in Google and in YouTube and in a whole bunch of other companies that transformed the, uh, the media landscape. We were dealing with competitors that were asleep and supine and entrenched and lazy and that operated monopolies. And the monopolies being their local, their advertising businesses. They had no idea what their customer did. All the data that we have today on, on, on uh, customers, nobody had that 20 years ago. You wouldn't have been able to tell 20 years ago whether uh, a subscriber read one article in the New York Times or 50 articles in the New York Times. You had no idea whatsoever if the product that you were giving your customer was actually succeeding. You were operating in the dark um, thinking that um, the, 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 the reader needs to know what it is that we deem important enough to give him or her. And that has been completely transformed. And today, obviously, uh, we're, we're living in a different, uh, a different um, universe. But it, it's exactly losing, not having information about what your customer does. Let all those businesses to operate and avoid. It led to their downfall. And I think largely they only had themselves to blame. That's very clear, very strident, interesting. I, mean, right. Steve. I, think I realize it's not something that is a popular message for this audience. So my apologies for everybody I've offended. No, they don't apologize. I think that's a US market analogy. <laughs> I think that's true in the US. I think because they're. You know, I think there's enough money in the market for those big media companies to be complacent because their, their model was still working. And it was, as Jeff Zucker said, digital dimes and TV dollars, you know. And it, those, so that's why some of those, those giant media corps didn't shift quickly and then had to lurch, I would say. I think the UK market is slightly different to that. 
think we're hungrier and more scrappy because there's less cash in the market. So we've had to be more enterprising and opportunistic, I would argue. And there's the BBC. And there's the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve, what enhancement of Reuters news would you like to spend more money on <laughs> if it made business sense to you? Um, we are uh, determined, and this is under Paul Baskerbear and uh, Alessandra Galoni's leadership, to be uh, the leading um, sort of harnesser, user, uh, unleasher of technology for the benefit of great journalism and news reporting. So I'd very much like to see over the next sort of 24 months a series of innovations and investments come out of Reuters that, that makes our journalists, uh, our photographers, our videographers, our editors the best they can be and sort of puts their uh, skills on steroids. And, uh, and, and the access they have to stories and storytelling um, and, uh, and the value they're providing to our customers and audiences. Uh, that, that's really where I'd like to see us uh, uh, push very, very hard over the next 24 months. So technology key. And that can be in, in news aggregation, in, 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 in getting the news, in sort of aggregating the news and telling the story or distributing it uh, to our customers. I think, I think all of those sort of areas of the value chain are ripe for um, significant improvement uh, over the next few years. Deborah, after a long successful time in the commercial news business at ITN and NBC, you're now at the helm of the state-funded news organization. What do you think you can and can't achieve at the BBC over the next five years? So it's license fee funded, which is slightly different. You'd say that. It's the people that pay for the BBC. And that's why the BBC must be for all the people. <laughs> and um, answer the question please what do you hope to achieve <laughs> what can I achieve so people ask me this a lot like how's it going and what's it like you know like you've gone to the dark side or something um, what's incredible is that a few months in I'm able to sit here and say I have never been more optimistic um, excited um, and positive in terms of being able to drive really quite radical change fast the BBC or the BBC News, the piece that I run, and the whole BBC, to be honest, is um, it, it really at a moment of great innovation, consumer-focused, data-led and driven, swinging to digital in a really creative way. And it's, you know, I picked the right moment to go to the BBC, having not worked there ever in my career before. I tried when I was about 21 and wasn't good enough at the time. But now I'm there and I, I am so happy and fulfilled and I've got a great team around me and we are doing new, exciting, radical things which will have impact on our audiences. And that's the only thing that matters. Will it impact the audience? You can build the best strategy in the world, but can you see it through to delivery? And I am confident that at the BBC, we will see the changes through to delivery and that anybody in this room who consumes BBC News, the test will be, you know, in a few months, are you starting to see it change? And all the change we drive has come from the consumer, the consumer, the consumer, listening all the time to what people are asking for and needing to make it better and to build the trust. Anything you can't achieve? Ah, oh, what can't I achieve? Uh, I can't drive commercial revenues in the UK. Mm. <laughs> to grow my business, it's, it's a different kind of growth that I'm driving and one that I'm becoming accustomed to. And hence the focus on, you know, trust is the currency. And I'm getting used to the measure. You know, the BBC asks the same set of questions to consumers all the time. Tick this box. Is the BBC, do you tick the box as the BBC is for me and rate us one to six? Anything, uh, you know, anything, sorry, six, um, anything beyond, beyond that doesn't matter. So you're looking at the people who really rate you high on the for me score and building digital daily habit to deepen the relationship so that the BBC is useful for people and delivering something unique, special and useful to their lives. And that's what it's all about. Very passionate. Thank you. So just in a word or two, I want to ask all of you whether you're optimistic about the future of investigative journalism. Catherine. I'm crazy optimistic. Good. <laughs> Steve. I, I, <laughs> I agree. I'm optimistic. I mean, if I just look at the last number of months uh, at Reuters, we broke the story this week about um, El Chapo's kids and the fentanyl story. We broke the story about uh, Tesla, inappropriate use of... Of, of imagery, we broke the story about child labour at Hyundai and then the Nigerian military. So my optimism's at an all-time high in terms of investigative journalism. For you, Deborah? 73% of the world's population do not live in a full democracy with free media. Our job is to investigate. You know, 
hold, hold power to account and go and do the kind of work that the BBC News does all the time with our documentary teams, whether it's a Modi documentary or Putin or you know, um, under, you know going, go, going to expose um, oil companies for gas flaring operations that are killing children with cancer in Iraq. Those stories really matter and it's going to be harder and harder to do it, but more and more important that we do. Thank you. Mike, optimistic? Well, in, the, in, the, in our short existence, we've already caused heads to roll at City Hall. Uh, we've exposed several hundred million dollars worth of malfeasance in uh, uh, city budgeting. Um, and I'm optimistic that the more that we can do for the customers that we've attracted um, to the standard, and the more that we can do for them in a variety of different things outside of investigative journalism, the more that we'll be able to concentrate on investigative journalism. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much.